Welcome to the Business of Story, where we connect you with the leading minds in the art of business storytelling. Learn from best-selling authors, Hollywood screenwriters, makers, content marketers, and brand raconteurs on how to craft and tell compelling stories that sell. The Business of Story is brought to you by Emma, which provides innovative email marketing tools and services that drive brilliant results. And by Convince and Convert, digital marketing advisors and counselors to leading brands and organizations worldwide. Convince and Convert helps you gain and keep your customers online. Here's your host, Park Powell. Hello, welcome to Business of Story. Great to have you here, especially in during this busy holiday season. I know you have a ton on your plate, not only business-wise, but personal-wise. I'm sure you're out scrambling around trying to figure out what's that gift you're going to get for that significant person in your life and how are you going to overcome all this stuff, get it done before the holidays so you can rest and relax and kick off the new year in style. So I'm hoping you are using Business of Story as an escape a place that you can plug in, get away, sit down, just take a deep breath and let this content, let the storytelling tips wash over you uh, to help you bring it all together for your personal and your professional brand to round out a very strong year in 2016 and to get ready to kick off an even more powerful, dynamic, successful year in 2017. So thank you for being here. If I sound a little bit like Walter Cronkite. It's because I was up visiting my wonderful folks in Seattle, Washington, just before Thanksgiving. And my two younger brothers, Mike and Chris, and I, with our good friend Darren Ponty, made our annual duck hunting trip over to, of all places, Potholes Reservoir, which is by Moses Lake in central Washington State. And can you think of a better name for a place in Potholes Reservoir for a duck hunt? Been uh, doing that since, I mean, we were little tiny kids. Our dad taught himself how to duck hunt, and he took all seven of us along. That's right, seven kids along sometimes on these amazing, crazy hunts out in eastern Washington, and it's been something that has stuck with us ever since. Me and my two younger brothers do it every year, and it's kind of the way of kicking off the holiday season, and we just really, great camaraderie, and we provide lots of ducks for lots of families for their holiday festivities. But while I was there, I got myself a bit of a cold, so that's why I'm sounding a little bit like Walter Cronkite this time around. Um, I almost called it off today, but I figured I'm going for it, and I'm really glad I did because we have a gentleman on today's show. His name is J.D. Dwyer. He is the founder of the Institute of WOW in um, Australia. He's on the Gold Coast of Australia. He said about an hour north, I guess, out of Sydney. Never been there. I got to get out there. But J.D. Dwyer, the Institute of Wow, and what he does, he's been around advertising marketing about as long as I have. And he helps brands find little wows and big wows to help them stand out, to help them take that step out of the primordial muck of commoditization and really do something different, differentiate their brand in the marketplace. So he's with us today, and we're talking about how you can bring some wow to your brand story telling, and he's going to take you through his proven process to do that, at least some of it. So you want to stick around, you're going to learn how do you find the wow in your offering, whether you're a solopreneur or representing clients and looking for their wow, or are a part of an in-house team in a mega brand. How do you find your wow? It's actually simpler than you think if you just take the time to look. Number two, he's going to cover how the wow factor helps you increase your margins because it actually takes the prospect's eyes off the price. That's right. How do you get the prospect to not care about the price because your wow factor, whether it's real or artificial, but artificial in an authentic way, um, is so powerful that you are their choice. And then finally, the five steps to build a wow factor. And how do you create customer loyalty in that process? So J.D.'s been really great. He's going to cover all of that today with us. He's also going to take us on a bit of a story on how he really pulled a coup in a wow factor by getting Jerry Seinfeld to become the spokesperson for a small credit union 
and their home loan program in Australia. So it's pretty interesting how he went about that, got him to do it, and how they created a wow factor in his commercials, of which you'll be able to see online as well. And, you know, you think that these folks like Jerry Seinfeld are not available to you or I, but they really are. All you got to do is pick up the phone and start asking around, have a little patience, a lot of persistence, and the next thing you know, you might have a wow factor like Seinfeld pitching your program. Um, and then finally... I want you to stick around because at the end of the show, JD's going to take us through the top three things that you need to do that every brand, be it your personal brand to grow influence or your business brand to grow sales of your product or service, the three things that you need to do right now, including, well, I'm not even going to tell you what that including is. You'll need to stick around and listen. So without further ado, let's jump right into this before I sneeze and cough into the mic and welcome J.D. Dwyer, the founder of the Institute of Wow, to Business of Story. Hey, J.D., welcome to the show. My pleasure. That is great to have you here. Now, where are you coming to us from? You're out in Australia somewhere. Whereabouts in Australia? Yeah, just on the uh, on the sunny Gold Coast, which is uh, a surface paradise in Australia, is very similar to Orlando in America. So uh, it's about an hour north of Sydney if you were to, to jump in a plane. Ah, okay, about an hour north of, north of Sydney on the Gold Coast. Beautiful. Well, it's great to have you here. I'm coming uh, from Phoenix, Arizona, and it's just always wonderful to bring in folks from around the world on Business of Story. So you are the founder. You've got this organization called the Institute of Wow. So that's a pretty big <laughs> promise. What do you do out there that totally wows people in the Institute of Wow? <laughs> Institute of Wow. Look, there's a number of my buddies would call it something else, but I won't go through that. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I've been in the advertising game for quite a while now, um, uh, Park, and uh, I guess really what I've learned over the period of time of being involved in helping business businesses market their products or services is if it doesn't have a wow factor then don't bother doing it and um, I find that a lot of businesses these days online and offline uh, tend to go down the path of price discounting and if you go down that path of price discounting then you know you're going to find it's a pretty hard road to be Walmart on prices so what I teach them is to actually create a wow factor and make sure that they stand out from the crowd. Well price Discounting is just your commodity. You're just putting yourself in the world of commodity in this day and age of abundance that our, you know, our audiences, our customers, our employees have an abundance of choices as to who they want to work with, buy from, be connected with. So it just seems like you can't afford to go down that, that price discounting path unless you're Walmart, essentially. Yeah, well, exactly. And I, I, I always question business owners, particularly small and medium business owners, um, why would you want to spend all that time putting together a marketing plan when it's based on price um, if it's not sustainable? And for most of us, it's just not sustainable. If you are Walmart um, and, you know, Costco and you've built your business around price discounting, then you can kill all the little guys every day of the week. And I say to the little guys, well, why do that? Why actually put together a marketing plan, build on something that's not sustainable? sustainable, put a marketing plan together based on principles that are sustainable. So, J.D., I mean, you and I both have been in the advertising business for a long time. It looks like, judging by your bio photo, I think we're roughly of the same <laughs> uh, same age. But, I mean, when you're in advertising, aren't you always looking for the wow factor? Even if you started this 30 years ago, isn't that what we're hired to do? Yeah, you would think so. You really would think so because you and I come from the era where they used to, well, I guess they still do. They call it the USP, your unique selling proposition. Um, and yet, crazy. I, I hold seminars uh, uh, around Australia. Um, I actually have been to Phoenix three times this year, would you believe, because I'm part of the Joe Polish really? Genius Network. I don't know whether you're familiar with Joe Polish, are you? No, Joe Polish? Yeah, there's a chap who comes out of uh, Phoenix who puts together a program called the Genius Network. Um, I'm the only one in the network who's not a genius, but but anyway. <laughs> um, so I've yeah, been to Phoenix quite a few times over the last 12 months, and uh, um, every time you meet with fellow entrepreneurs who essentially um, are on stage putting seminars together for you know business owners and so forth, um, they're astounded as I am um, that despite the fact that USP has been around us an acronym for many years, unique selling proposition, very, very few um, business owners, 
actually go down the path of looking for that wow factor. They, they, the first opportunity they get, they drop their price, and then they wonder why that's not working. <laughs> Is there something different from the unique value proposition or selling proposition in the wow factor, or are they one and the same? It's just that they haven't taken the time to dig into what that is. Well, good question. And and one would think on the surface, well, isn't it just the same? You've come up with your you know cute little name. Uh, J- By the way, the reason I get JD is my name is John Dwyer, but I hadn't copped that since I was about 10. They, the initials just roll off the tongue, so that's the reason for the JD. Mm-hmm. But they'll say, they'll say to me, look, JD, isn't it the same? And on the surface, it may seem that we call it USP, call it wow factor, call it what you like. But my view is is that the wow factor goes beyond the unique selling proposition because there are some businesses that just don't have a unique selling proposition. Um, they've got the same wheelbarrow that you can buy down the road in the big uh, multinational uh, hardware uh, store. So therefore, they don't have a USP. And what I say to them is that you need a unique um, artificial wow factor. And the best example of that would be McDonald's. Um, I've got six children and they're 18 through to nearly 30 these days. But at one stage, my wife and myself had six children under 12 and McDonald's got about $6 billion out of us throughout the, <laughs> that era um, mm-hmm. because because the Disney toy, it all came down to the artificial wow factor of that free toy. So McDonald's didn't have any particular unique selling proposition with that hamburger box, um, but it did have a unique selling proposition when you they developed an artificial wow factor, which was the toy. Now, you've done a lot of work with big brands over the years, Pizza Hut, McDonald's, as you mentioned, KFC, 7-Eleven, and others. What do you do when you go in? How do you help them find their wow factor? And how can our listeners uh, find what their true wow factor is? Because i got to believe everybody has one, from that solopreneur, that person working out of their house, trying to make ends meet, um, all the way up to the big conglomerates, a la McDonald's. Yeah, look, I guess the first question that I would have for the big guys and little guys, I mean, these days I have a a whole, you know, sort of different range of businesses, whether it be services or whether it be products, and some of them are doing half a million turnover, others are doing 20, 30, 50 million turnover, and of course the McDonald's of this world are way up there above that, but I guess it's the same question. I will just say to them, look, okay, what is the wow factor? And if they don't have one, then we've got to dream up an artificial wow factor. And I guess the best example of that would be if you were a hair salon and I said to you, okay, well, if you put a sign outside your door today and you said 10% off, you know, everything, do you think that women would be busting your door down to get their hair, you know, looked after at your hair salon? And the answer is no, uh, with Groupon and and all the other coupon, you know, sort of online uh, offers these days nobody's going to run into your salon if it's just a 10% discount. And I'll say to them, look, why don't you do this? Why don't you actually say for every $50 that somebody spends in your hair salon, you give them a movie point, as in a picture theatre cinema movie point. And when they save uh, six movie points, which means that they've spent six times $50 in your hair salon, um, which means $300, you give them two tickets to the movies. And let's just say for argument's sake, that's $15 a ticket, two tickets are $30, $30 is 10 percent of the 300 so i will guarantee you that every single time that wow factor loyalty program of two cinema tickets when they've got six points will easily beat the 10 percent off that's that's funny because i don't you don't think of movie theater tickets being wow when you know when you think of the institute of wow i'm thinking something really (laughs) big but what you're saying is it doesn't necessarily have to be like way out there it can be something as common as a as a movie ticket but done right communicated right it can be a bit of a wow factor that separates you from your competition i guess it's horses for courses too park i mean i had a um a bank here in australia uh, it was a building society but same thing and they were uh, look a reasonable size business they're a five billion dollar business um uh, up against some big banks in australia there would be many 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 billions of dollars bigger and when i got involved with them i said well what's your unique selling point what's your wow factor and of course they didn't really have one because if you get money from one bank versus another bank that same ten dollar note or thousand dollar note is going to look the same and so we developed a program that if you swapped your home loan to the greater building society we gave you a free vacation and it went crazy Uh, we took their eyes off the price because keep in mind the whole idea of a wow factor is to take your prospects eyes off the price and when we said look swap your home loan to the Greater Building Society from one of the banks uh, because they're charging you fees and they they don't do all the nice things that a building society does, but also we'll give you a free vacation. It just went nuts. We tripled their home loans within the first um, three months and we quadrupled them within 18 months. 
So taking your prospect's eyes off the price That's it. is the idea. So price becomes a non-issue. You get to keep your margins high, and you simply are going to then benefit. They give them added value through that wow factor incentive. Absolutely. The whole idea is is that for all of us in business, the last thing we want to do is to market our services on price unless we have a business model like Walmart um, that's built for that. But for the rest of us, we want to retain margin. Absolutely. So, you know, our show is all about business storytelling. So how does the wow factor come into how you tell and the kinds of stories you tell about, you know, uh, on behalf of your clients? Yeah, look, um, Park, if you don't mind, what I might do is just go through the five steps that I tell everybody in business that they should be following. Um, And it's very much built around direct response. So, of course, well, if we you've all... listened to this show, you know I'm all about steps. So, yes, absolutely. What are the five <laughs> steps? Okay, okay. Um, and you know what? Whenever I'm speaking on stage, I always um, uh, say to the audience, look, I, I promise I'm not going to be one of those speakers that will get on stage and say I've got a 29-step system. <laughs> I, whenever I've been into a seminar or conference and someone says they've got a 20-step a, a system, I just go, oh, no, kill me now, please. So this is very simple. Nothing it's, over five. Nothing, nothing over five. <laughs> nothing over five. Number one, identify your most profitable customer and then just look for more people who look like him or her. Pretty simple. Number two, create a wow factor to take their eyes off the price. Uh, number three, uh, give them a problem and then give them a solution, what I call a problem-solution scenario, and Neurofen are pretty good at that. Uh, number four, um, fix your website. And I can't say it um, any more simple than that. Just fix your website because I do believe that, you know, 80% or more of businesses, big and small, don't have the right components on their website, particularly their homepage, to keep people sticky. Um, and then number five, um, stimulate repetitive trade by making sure you have some form of loyalty system or reward system so that you just don't sell once you have somebody becoming a longer term customer. So stimulate your – number five is stimulate your loyalty trade. Is that what you said? Uh, repetitive trade. Repetitive oh, trade. Oh, I'm sorry. Repetitive trade. Or this – basically create a loyalty program that keeps them coming back for more. Exactly. And the, the, the easiest and most simple version of that we, that we all see is the cafe that gives us that little sort of membership card that we put in our wallet. And when you get nine coffees, um, you get the tenth one for free. You know, that's all well and good. Um, I've got a juice stand right around the corner here, Nectar, which is really great. You know, I mean, they they create all kinds of smoothies. and They're really wonderful for you. And they've got this loyalty card that is so doggone hard to use. I guess I've got to use my energy I'm getting from the protein drink just to make it happen. (laughs) For instance, I go in um, and I first get registered for it. I've got it. It's on my phone. So to use it, I've got to pull up my app and let them know I'm buying and that sort of thing. (laughs) <laughs> no big deal. But if I forget to do that, um, as I do several times, um, I will go in there, buy it, and I go, oh, dang, I need to get my loyalty thing. Well, then I've got to come back to the office, get on email, you know, email them, show them a copy of the receipt that I got it, and it gets this really funky, cumbersome, Luddite way of redeeming my points. But it just seems so strange to me. There's got to be an easier way. Why do they make it so hard? How do you go out of your way to work with your clients, not only to help them find that wow factor, but then make it easy for the customers to experience that wow factor? Park, you've just you've just chosen my pet subject, and that is that technology has you know certainly improved our lives in lots and lots of ways. But just don't screw with something that's you know the kiss principle, keep it simple, stupid sort of thing. I mean, these loyalty cards I know have been taken over by apps. Um, but I'm here to tell you that most of the clients that I have in the hospitality or the restaurant cafe sort of game have gone back to the old card because of exactly what you just said. Um, and particularly for people over the age of 50 um, who aren't used to downloading a million apps, uh, they're just not they're just not going to react to something like that. So what you've just experienced is exactly you know what I preach. I say, look, go back to the old fashioned way. Look, the thing is, is that. Most of the business owners who come into the world, you know, my wow world, if you like, um, have never experienced direct response marketing. Um, They've been ripped off by either advertising agencies or just because they've been reading the wrong books, I don't know. But the question I ask them is that do you think you need a good product um, to make money? And, of course, they all put their hand up and say yes. And I say, okay, do you think McDonald's makes the best hamburger in the world? 
And then, of course, they realised that most people would probably argue no, and yet they sell more hamburgers than anyone else in the world. And the reason is because they understand marketing. And so, therefore, the moment I, I guess, convince the business owner that marketing is probably more important than fixing their operations and fixing their HR and anything else in their business, then I say to them, can you tell me, do you know anyone who's ever bought anything off the side of a bus or the back of a taxi? or, for that matter, a billboard on the freeway, or the electronic signs that run around the NFL matches every week. Um, could, I always ask anyone, could they just even tell me the name of one of the advertisers, let alone have they ever bought anything off that? And I guess the point I'm making, Park, is that for most business owners, they think that that brand building exercise is something that they need to do, including social media, much of which is not measurable. And then I take them down the path of showing them that, most of that stuff for small to medium-sized businesses is a waste of money. And it's a waste of money because no one has ever been able to convince me that there's been a sale made by any of those electronic signs on the fence of the football on the weekend. And once they grasp that, then they grasp the benefits of direct response marketing, which is an entirely different thing altogether. So when I go down through your five-step list here, J.D., I mean, it feels a little bit like story structure to me, but then again, I view a lot of the world through story eyes now. But number one, first and foremost, is you got to identify your audience. Who are you talking to and what do they care about, right? I mean, that's what it always seems to begin with. And yet, so often, especially in the B2B world, um, the clients are reticent or they don't take the time to truly understand and dial in that very niched, interested audience audience. Do you find that in the work you do in Australia as well? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a universal problem. And it's not so much that they don't have in their mind an overall picture of their target audience. Most of them will say, yeah, look, we're after women or we're after men or blue singlets or white collars. But I say to them, look, have you drilled down to determine who's your most profitable customer? And probably, if you don't mind me doing a bit of name dropping, um, uh, Park, I, I was fortunate enough to work with Jerry Seinfeld in the last um, few years. And uh, uh, I convinced him to become the spokesman of this bank that I spoke of, the Greater Building Society. And the reason that we pitched to Seinfeld to be the spokesperson for this bank in little old Australia was that I said to the bank, who's your most profitable home loan customer? And the bank said to me, oh, look, anyone who's getting married or, you know, forming a relationship and wants to get a home loan. I said, no, 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 you don't want a millennial to be a, you know, home loan um, prospect. I'm not saying you wouldn't stop a 20-something from getting a home loan, but you want someone who's over 40 because they're going to be borrowing more money for their second or their third or their fourth home. And then the light came on and they said, gosh, okay, well, how do we do that? And I said, well, you've got to get a home loan, get a free vacation thing going nuts. Why don't we just put another wow factor on top of that? And then we put the research survey out to look for someone who was very, very popular universally with men and women over 40 and who was, you know, well known. And of course, um, just my luck, the name Seinfeld popped up, which I gave myself the worst job in the world <laughs> to try and convince and him to do it. <laughs> how in the world did you, yeah, how did you track him down and convince Jerry Seinfeld to be the spokesperson for a bank in Australia? Well, I guess it's what you and I would tell our kids, and that is be persistent. <laughs> and um, that's, we were, I, I look, I uh, went through the normal procedure of going through creative artists in uh, Hollywood, and that was going nowhere because, you know, they get a thousand of me ringing up all the time. So I thought, oh, well, I'll go through his manager, George Shapiro, and you'll see at the end of the TV show, it's a Shapiro West production, uh, Howard West and, and George Shapiro, you know, sort of found Seinfeld all those years ago. So so I contacted, um, yeah, George Shapiro's office in uh, in Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills and um, left a message uh, at one o'clock in the morning uh, so that he would get the Australian accent. I put on my best Crocodile Dundee accent you could you could do at one o'clock in the morning. And when he came, of course, to work, Americans love that stuff. <laughs> yeah, it was it was good. Hey, mate, how are you? It's JD from down under, you know. <laughs> so I did, I did whatever. <laughs> ah, perfect. That's your wow factor. Okay, keep rolling. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I stole a few lines from Steve. Steve Irwin. And uh, so anyway, as it turned out, obviously we were more professional than that. I 
sent over an email to him and uh, made sure that you know, the email was there the day before. And then, of course, this silly Aussie accent, you know, voicemail was there that night. And uh, two days went by and my phone rang and I thought it was a gotcha call from, you know, one of my buddies because I told them what I had done. But then when George um, sort of dropped a few of his you know, sort of background details, I knew it was the real George Sapira. And we got on pretty well on the phone. He's pretty sarcastic and, and so am I. And within about half an hour, we'd built a nice relationship on on the phone he said leave it with me and i'll uh, i'll have a talk to jerry and uh, about two days later uh, he came back and said yeah jerry thought it would be good fun um, what i've asked them to do is basically take the mickey out of the banks and you know tell customers to come to a building society and when i asked jerry eventually why he said yes because obviously i had to go over and meet him a few times after we pulled off the deal he said you know what no one from australia has ever asked me before so i just thought this might be good fun so there you go Ask and you shall receive. So did he have a big hand in the creative coming in? Or how did how do you write for Jerry Seinfeld? You you don't. <laughs> you don't. Um, yeah, part of the deal park was that he had creative control over everything. So I would write the scripts and then he would throw them in the garbage bin and start again. <laughs> but you'd get your main points across and then let him run with it and have some fun. You got it. It sounds like you've been in the same uh, boat because that's exactly what would happen. <laughs> well, not with Jerry, but maybe one of these days we'll see if we can get him on the show. <laughs> now that you know him, maybe you can help me connect him. <laughs> um, can people see these? Can our listeners see these spots that you did or hear them? Or where, where could they go to see what Jerry did for your, your customer? Because talking yeah. about a wow, wow factor. Yeah, absolutely. Look, um, and, and first of all, before I tell you where they can go, um, the, uh, the results were – quite stunning. Uh, keep in mind, this was a wow factor on top of a wow factor. So for a number of years from the year yeah. to 2003, 2004, through till, you know, a few years ago, then the get a home loan, get a free vacation was doing very well. You put someone like Jerry Seinfeld on top of that, and uh, it just went nuts. Uh, basically, they tripled their home loan market share in Australia in the first two years of uh, Jerry's involvement. So that was just massive. Um, and look, you can have a look at the ads. If you just go to YouTube and type in Greater Building Society, Jerry Seinfeld, um, Greater is G-R-E-A-T-E-R, so Greater Building Society, Jerry Seinfeld. Or if you wanted to have a look at the suite of ads that we put together, just if they go to my website at theinstituteofwow.com. So that's theinstituteofwow.com. And I've got a whole section there on the Seinfeld campaign. That's great. Well, let's keep going back. Let's keep going through this uh, Greater Building Society since we're on it. So you identified their audience. They first thought it was millennials, and you said, no, no, no. It's probably that second or third time buyer, 40 plus. They were going to have more money. Who do they care about? Um, well, personality and Jerry Seinfeld. So in addition to buy a home, get a vacation, you add a wow factor uh, personality on top of that to deliver it. Now, let's get into the problem solution scenario, because that's very story, certainly. You know, you've got the setup. We've gone through the setup. You have to have a problem. Um, you have to have somehow some sort of market disruption going on or a, a, a wrong that you are writing on behalf of a customer to make the story work. Um, and of course, then you are the solution. So tell us, how do you articulate that problem solution scenario for the greater building society? Good, good. Okay. And uh, the, in the greatest instance, the problem that most people had uh, was that they were, that their home loan was with a big um, faceless bank. Uh, who charged them a lot of fees, um, didn't treat them like a person, but rather treated them like a number. And not in a million years would they give them a box of chocolates, let alone a free vacation. So um, it's a very, very good point you bring up because there were a couple of other credit union building societies that actually copied the concept of getting a free vacation, and yet they failed miserably. And the reason they did was that they forgot to launch their campaign with what we did, and that is is that we were John Wayne in the in the white gear and the cowboys were the big banks in the in the dark, you know, gear if you look at from a cowboy western point of view. And we had to paint the All banks right. We had to paint the banks as being bad guys. So we would say at the beginning of the ad, it would be a sepia tone. If you can visualize a TV ad, I'm, we did this right across online and offline, but just the easiest way to explain to anyone listening, this would be TV. So therefore, there would be a, a couple sitting at their dining room table and they're not very happy. They're rubbing their forehead. And of course, the tone of the TV commercial was sepia, pretty close to black and white. And the voiceover would say, do you have your home loan with a bank? And they're charging you lots of fees and they're charging you, you know, lots of money to do silly things and you're not having a happy experience with them because they're treating you like a number and then all of a sudden heavily music uh, white doves <laughs> and i'm being 
silly, but, you know, the, basically the transformation was if you swap your home loan to the Greater Building Society, not only will you avoid paying those fees because we're a mutual, we don't need to charge them, but also we're going to give you a fee vacation. And the next minute you see the husband and wife in, in Hawaii or Tahiti or Fiji and they're enjoying a pina colada and, of course, they're in, you know, in, the, in the idyllic location. And it was as simple as that. And at the end of the advertisement, we'd just have a call to action. We'd say, your problem was this. This is the solution. Swap to the Greater Building Society. And then the call to action was to go to the website or ring 13 13 96. So you're really playing against the commoditization idea. This, you know, you have an abundance of choices out there in banks for your home loan. And the old way of doing things is look at you're just a number at this faceless bank. They just are, you know, counting your accounts, your dollars, and they don't really care that much about you. That is the problem. The solution then, your first step out of that primordial muck of commoditization is finding that unique value proposition and then wrapping that around a wow factor. So people go, wow, you really are different. So the Greater Absolutely. Building Society's unique value proposition is you're not a, you're not a number but a face. Or, I mean, it, to really boil it down in most basal terms. Um, but then you've got to back that up. So you back it up through giving them a vacation, and then bring in Jerry Seinfeld to, as you say, take the Mickey out of uh, the typical banking experience. And also, to Park, a very, very uh, important part of this is that um, you need uh, real people testimonials because uh, when you are giving a free vacation, uh, and obviously the vacation um, was based on the amount of the home loan. So if you borrowed two or three hundred thousand, you may get a vacation to Fiji. If you borrowed five or six or seven hundred thousand, you were off to Disneyland. So based on the size of your loan, you had so many holiday points which you could trade for locations. But what we would do is that we'd always use um, real people. So therefore, after you're showing the imagery of these people enjoying themselves in Hawaii, you would have uh, Bill and Betty would come on and they would say, look, we swapped our home loan um, from the nasty banks who were treating us pretty poorly. And we're so glad we did because at the Greater Building Society, we don't pay all those fees. And we had a w- wonderful trip to Tahiti. Now you start putting real people testimonials into something like this. And all of a sudden it gives it a credibility that it may not have had if it was just a voiceover. Mm -hmm. And the name itself, the Greater Building Society, is really a nice change of, you know, Chase, Manhattan, and, you know, Wells Fargo, and that sort of thing, that it really does make you feel like you're a part of a community uh, versus just going to a bank. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and look, we gave it a very cheeky demeanor. I mean, look, to be honest with you, it's a boring bank like all banks. I mean, the, the, when people would say to me, <laughs> when, people, when people would say to me, oh, well, it must be good fun to work for them. I said, I would say to them as a consultant, I would go in every, you know, seven to 10 days. And I said, look, I'm sorry. And uh, it's a boring bank. It's the same as all the other banks. Uh, what we've done here is that uh, it, it sounds awful to say this, but I was a speedboat dragging an anchor, to be honest with you, um, because I'd go into these meetings where you'd have a big boardroom table and of course there was all these boring bankers around the table and I would say listen we're going to spike up the uh, home loan uh, get a free vacation with um, giving 10 cents per litre uh, let's say per gallon in your language, but it's 10 cents per litre petrol discount, fuel uh-huh. discount. And they said, what? We've already given away free holidays. I said, yeah, but look, we've got to keep this fresh. And I've noticed the numbers are starting to sort of level at the moment after seven years. So how about we give away 10 cents per gallon um, fuel discount, as in gas? And I'll, I'll never forget the general manager said to me, have you gone nuts? We've given you a little bit of rope and you've become a bit of a mini superstar. Now you've lost it. What, what are you talking about? And uh, he said, do we have to build gas stations? I said, no, 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 no. How it would work is that on top of the vacation, we now make sure that no competitor comes anywhere near us because we give 10, I'll stick to litres because that's my language here, but we give 10 cents a litre away um, every week for an entire year. And they said, what? I said, well, 50 litres a week. Uh, multiplied by 10 cents is $5, multiplied by, you know, 52 weeks, that's 260 lousy dollars is going to cost you every year. And at the moment, you pay a mortgage broker $1,200. So I know which one's got more wow factor to it. And uh, that's what we did. We came on TV and we said, listen, um, not only will you get a free vacation, but for the next month or two, we're going to actually give you 10 cents per litre every single week gas discount for an entire year. Mm -hmm. It, It went nuts. Their switchboards melted. And just something as simple as that. Again, it, I think of, wow, like I think of Jerry Seinfeld, but you're talking about just simply 10 cents a liter, um, and it made all the difference. 
It is, and mm. see, the thing is, though, is that going, I don't know. I don't know whether you guys mm. have it in the states at the moment, but we have a big uh, supermarket program here where one of the supermarkets gives four cents a litre um, off your pet, off your fuel, and uh, it's been very successful for many years. So, if you came out with a ten cents per litre, which is two and a half times that, there was a there was basically a benchmark that we could be sort of measured against. So people went nuts when they realised yeah. that they could get ten cents a litre every week for fifty two weeks. Yeah, we do have something like that Safeway here in Chevron, at least for me. I, I shop in gas up there, and, and there's a, a connection there. But let me go back to this idea of here you are working with a big, boring bank, um, which is not uncommon anywhere around the world. And you've got Jerry Seinfeld, a very uncommon comedian American, you know, taking the mickey out of your, your competition. How did you make sure that that played across to the customer service? Because I would think if you're showing one thing, you're telling one story through Jerry Seinfeld, and then you've got this big, boring bank backing it up, that there, there could be a real disconnect there, losing the authenticity of the overall wow factor. And how did you overcome that? Yeah, good question, uh, Park. Um, look, when I say that they were typically boring like most banks, um, I, I just mean that behind the scenes. Um, in terms of their customer service, they were anything but boring. They were fantastic. And they really did go beyond the call of duty that banks wouldn't. So, for example, at that particular time, I don't think it would be very different now, but at that particular time, uh, the banks were running at about 65% customer satisfaction level. The grader was running at 96% customer satisfaction level. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they had a much, much more Disney style customer service ethic. And uh, what we found is that when we got people, we didn't lose them. So the churn rate for a bank um, for their home loan customers was running at about 30 something percent. The churn rate for the Greater Building Society was running at 2.4 percent, which meant that we, that was the reason I was saying to the Building Society at that time, do anything, give them a box of chocolates, give them a holiday, give them a vacation give them whatever you have to do because once you get them you're only losing 2.4 percent of them every year the banks on the other hand had a churn rate which means people leaving of about 30 something percent ah all right so we're going through the five steps the step number four is fix your website did you have to get in and do some work on their website to make yeah, this all happen yeah, pretty much. And look, it's the case with most businesses. Um, most businesses have a website that's full of information instead of a direct response-driven website that's um, full of sales focus. And I say to everybody, look, and I hate to go through a step pro <laughs> a step program again, Park, but you've got to have a problem solution headline in anything you do. And of course, your homepage of your website these days is your director of first impressions. So if you don't present a problem and provide a solution in your headline, I think you're crazy. Um, and it may not be necessarily a problem solution, but what it can be is at least a benefit driven headline. Whereas a lot of businesses, as you know, um, fail to recognize that the most important real estate for on their homepage is above the fold, which is the bottom of their computer screen. And regardless of the fact that 50% of websites now are looked upon on smartphones, there's still 50% of people sitting behind their computer. Um, so after that problem solution headline, you need a welcome explanatory video, in my opinion. Uh, the world is all about video now, so why don't you hit them with a video up front and explain to them exactly what your product or service is going to do to help them. And the third thing is they need to have a data capture facility because uh, um, you'd be I'm, I'm, well. You wouldn't be amazed, Park, because you're living with this all the time. But you know, I'm amazed that hardly any websites have a data capture facility. In other words, a free something to capture data. They just don't do it, and it'd be like having a dinner party and not knowing who was there. Mm -hmm. So, what are some of the better ones that you've seen that work? That data capture? Are you talking about capturing an email, giving something away free? So we call it gated content. I'm sure you probably call it something similar. Yep. Um, is that what you're talking about? There's you've got a wow factor giveaway right there. That man, I got to have this, and so I'm going to give you my contact info. Exactly. So if you were a, a kitchen renovator, um, you know that whoever's come to your website, whether it's through pay-per-click or whether it's through search engine optimization, whatever means that they've come to your website, you know that they're there because they want to renovate their kitchen and you're on the shopping list. So why don't you have a free report where it says, listen, um, just download this free report. It's the three biggest mistakes that most people make when they're actually uh, getting their kitchen renovated or choosing a kitchen renovator. Uh, hint, hint, that's not really an Italian granite bench top. And the moment you do that, then all of a sudden, whoever's on that website surely is going to want to download that free report. And you immediately are catapulted as the trusted advisor instead of just another supplier. 
You know, it's great. So many things happen in threes. I'm a huge believer in threes, and the three-act structure certainly permeates everything we do at Business of Story with the story cycle, and even just what you're talking about there. Um, Everything happening above the fold in three steps. Step one is that setup, which is a problem-solution headline to capture their attention. Act two, step two, is then that explanatory video that leads you. I'm sure, you know, you've got to start with some conflict in there saying, hey, you know, in our case, you have an important brand story to be told, but it's probably not being heard, you know, in the din of the attention economy. Therefore, when you bring storytelling to your work, you will tickle that subconscious, that reptilian brain that just can't help but love it, it, the bewitchery of story, help you arise above the noise. And here's the system in which to do it. And then you go in act three, like you're talking about, is gated content that says, all right, now here are the three biggest mistakes you're probably making right now with your brand storytelling. And then here's the book. Now I can tell you, I'm not doing any of that, JD, but I'm, go- I'm making notes and going to start doing that right after. After this show, <laughs> yeah, well, look, and, but it and, comes down to the three act structure story essentially. It does, and you know what, Park? At the at, at outside of that structure, the, those three points, though, I, I always say to people, um, um, we are skeptical as as consumers. That's just the way it is. I mean, we've seen so many people get ripped off, and you know, all, across all sorts of services and products, that we are just skeptical. And in order to combat that skepticism, particularly if you're in the service game like I am, and I, you know, I know you are, then you need mm-hmm. to present yourself as a professional and put your credibility on the line and make sure that they understand that you are the trusted advisor. And the best way to do that is to have video testimonials. And so the other thing that I do suggest to people is don't put your testimonials on your testimonial page. No one will ever see them. We've done the heat mapping. We know that nobody goes there. So therefore, if you've got some great testimonials, throw out all the written ones, nobody reads them, and just only have um, iPhone video testimonials. And I say iPhone just to get the message across that you don't need a camera crew, uh, but if you can afford a camera crew, do it that way. Um, I've got 28 video testimonials on my website, and there's no way that anyone would watch all of those. I realise that. But if you're a butcher and you see that one of my video testimonials happens to be a butcher, there's a good chance you might click that one. And what I suggest to everybody is that, you know, get the best two, three, four or five of your video testimonials and make sure they're on your homepage because that's where they should be. Ah, very good point. Put them on your homepage. Um, J.D., let's take a moment to take a break so that our wonderful sponsors can tell their stories. And when they come back, if you can give us, and again, it's that power of three, those three things that our audience can take away from this show that you can bring to them through the Institute of Wow that they're not going to get from any other guest on Business of Story. So let's do that right after these messages. Hey, if you like what you're hearing here on Business of Story, then you are going to love Definitive, the email from Convince and Convert that many marketers say is the most useful resource around. Each day, the team at Convince and Convert picks a topic and sends you the three best resources ever created about that topic. It's topical, it's timely, it's useful. So go to definitivedigest.com and subscribe for free right now. Hey, I've got a question for you. What's the best call to action button color on your website? Yeah, you probably didn't see that one coming, did you? Well, what's the best shape and sizes of your CTA buttons? And what copy gets more clicks? You know, these questions have interrupted my sleep patterns for weeks now until I downloaded a helpful new email marketing guide from Emma called Why We Click, The Psychology Behind a Great Call to Action. You'll learn how applying just a little bit of brain science can transform your CTA buttons into small but mighty conversion powerhouses. It covers the button color, copy, and placement that helps skyrocket click rates. Check it out at myemma.com forward slash click. You know, Emma helps marketers everywhere send smart, stylish email newsletters, promotions, and automated campaigns, and help us all rest a little easier knowing our email marketing is doing its job. So check out their new publication at myemma.com forward slash click. You, like all business leaders and communicators, have an important brand story to tell, but it's probably not being heard. There's just too much competition for our attention, unless, of course, you tell a better story. 
For over a year now, I have connected you with more than 50 international story artists through this podcast to help you craft your ideal brand story for the growth of your enterprise and your people. Did you know I'm also available to you for speaking engagements, brand and leadership story workshops, even for one-on-one Skype or telephone brand story strategy consults? Plus, you can begin clarifying your brand story right now by downloading the interactive DIY workbook at businessofstory.com. You see, your sales don't have to be comedies or tragedies. You can make them epic by clarifying your brand story and connecting with audiences and customers like never before. So download your workbook today at businessofstory.com. And if you're not 100% satisfied, I'll happily refund your money. And one last thought. Just remember the most potent story you ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a good one, my friends. Story on. Welcome back to Business of Story and our guest today from Down Under, J.D. Dwyer, the founder of the Institute of Wow. Now, J.D., the other day I was listening to my good friend Jay Bear. He was doing a live uh, broadcast, live feed on Facebook, and he mentioned this idea that actually comes from Sally Hogshead, and it is different is better than better. And we started this show um, talking about we're all kind of living in this turmoil of commoditization and what you do with the Institute of WOW is help people take that first primordial step out of the commoditization world and into something that elevates them in the hearts and minds of their customers. So different truly is better than better. What are three things that our audiences can do um, to bring that wow factor into their life and make them just enough different from their competition to stand out again in the hearts and minds of their customers? Great, uh, great question and great comment too, Park, because uh, I'm sure you come from the same world that I do, and that is to make a difference, you've got to be different. And um, um, I wish I could say that I dreamt that up, but I just stole that off the bottom of a calendar one day, that's all. But uh, to, make, to make a difference, you've got to be different. Um, um, look, I, I think that, number one, um, for all of us in business, um, just be careful that you don't fall into the trap of becoming a member of too many um, chambers of commerce. Uh, I'm being sarcastic here, but I've uh. never I've never been to a chamber of commerce meeting where I've walked away with hard nipples. Um, the, 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 most chambers of commerce meetings are you know pretty much the norm, and what I would say to anyone, including my own children, who are all millennials, uh, and that is hang around with people who say why not, not people who say why. And um, I don't want to get, you know, sort of too corny with my my sayings, but the fact of the matter is is that um, I made the mistake in the early part of my career hanging around with people who used to say all the time, oh, why? Why would we do that? Why would we do this? When, in fact, in the latter start of, stage of my career, and I guess it's just because you become a little bit more mature and maybe you don't suffer fools so, so much, but I've hung around with a whole bunch of people in the last 15 or 20 years uh, who say, why not? Let's just do that. So that's point number one, hang around with the right people who are a little bit crazy. Um, number two, um, just be absolutely um, fanatical on collecting data. Um, here in Australia, we have two big football codes. One is rugby and the other one is called the Australian Football League. And they had their grand finals uh, a, a month or so ago. One had 84,000 at the grand final. The other one had 101,000 at the grand final. And neither of those football codes have any clue who was there. And that, I think, is a cardinal sin because can you imagine how many caps and and T-shirts and various other supporter merchandise they could be selling if they knew who came to their game? The ticketing agencies Mm -hmm. do, but they don't have any relationship with the football. But, you know, you can walk into just about any offline business today and most online businesses and no one will ask for your details. No one does what Amazon does. So you can walk into Walmart, you can walk into any gas station, you can walk into any supermarket, you can go to McDonald's today, 29 million Americans will go into a McDonald's today, but McDonald's have no clue who they are. If I was running McDonald's, I would be sacking the marketing manager tomorrow, because whilst they're fabulous in terms of overall marketing, it's crazy that they now actually get you to sit there for 60 seconds whilst they supposedly are making a hamburger, and they give you a receipt with a number on it, but they don't get you to fill in anything to win a prize. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. I would say number two, collect 
uh, data and do it religiously, both online and offline. And the third thing I would suggest to everybody is that don't do anything without um, a plan to um, stimulate repetitive purchasing because you don't want a customer once, you want a client for a longer period of time. I was going to say for life, but not all of us can you know, expect that we're going to have a client for life, but certainly you want a client more than once, and the only way you can get them more than once is to collect their contact details. And the most important piece of that contact detail now is no longer their email, uh, it's SMS. Uh, so therefore it's their mobile or cell number, um, because at the end of the day, you will get a 94% open rate on an SMS message as opposed to, you know, you'll be dancing in the street if you get double digits uh, in terms of an open rate on an email if it's a cold list. Um, but even on a cold list with a cell number, you will get a 94% average open rate on an SMS message, which just blitzes email. Hmm. So get that data on your customers so you're knowing your audiences, and then whenever possible, get their phone so that you can send them an SMS text message because the open rates are so much higher there, and hopefully without pissing them off at the same time. Yeah, and, and you know what, Park? We have a restaurant. But they've got opt-in. Yeah, well, well yeah, uh, yeah, depending upon what state you might be. We don't have that problem here in Australia at the moment. We don't have to opt in for SMS messages. Um, it'll come, I'm sure, and I'm not sure. Do you have that right across America you have to opt in? Well, I think you do have that choice, and it's more of a courtesy than anything. I mean, they allow you to do that when you're signing up. You know, would you like to receive text messages from us because people are afraid about using up their da- data plans and, you know, yeah. um, brands really uh, diving into where they're not supposed to be in a customer's journey. So they want to make sure that they opt in in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, yeah. Look, I've got, a, I've got to tell you a success story with SMS, just a very quick one. Uh, Park in Australia, <clears throat> we, have a, 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 we have a coaching program program called the masterclass and and this particular restaurant is uh, called the lobster cave uh, it's in melbourne um and uh it's about 50 minutes out of the main city of melbourne so it's in a very exclusive very upmarket um area by the water uh with the homes all being million dollar homes um he came onto my program and he was spending half a million dollars on radio and newspapers and all sorts of things and i said to him look stop that because the newspapers and the radio were getting across a wide sort of geographic region like melbourne when in fact, you know, it was pretty much the rich people living in his little seaside suburb that were coming to his restaurant. And you could tell by the amount of BMWs outside his restaurant. So what we did is that we just stopped all of that, saved him half a million dollars within the first month of him being on our program. And all we did was give the host, uh, the waitresses, 50 cents incentive for every contact detail that they got. So you can imagine nobody left that restaurant with the waitress. They practically tackled them at the door to get their phone number and their their email address. Um, He's got 51,000 on that list now, but even in the first six months, he picked up three or 4,000. And uh, he's the only restaurant in the world that's 100% full every night of the week. He's never, ever not 100% full because all that happens, he comes in at mid-afternoon, screams out to his uh, long-suffering secretary, Cheryl, can you tell me what our occupancy rate is tonight? She says 60 out of 120 seats. And he says, well, send out one of our SMSs that JD put together. And of course, I put together a whole host of SMSs. It might be a dinner for two for lobster tail for $68. And of course, you don't leave for less than $200 by the time you buy everything else that they upsell. But the fact of the matter is, is that she'll send out an SMS message to a 1,000 of his um, database. That'll fill another 40 seats. And then he'll say, we'll send out another 300 to fill the rest of the seats and every single afternoon he fills his restaurant every single night with below the line marketing like that and how do they go about getting that email or or phone number without being too intrusive all that happens uh, really really simple um either one of two ways we have um uh, an insurance um uh, uh, lloyds of london have what they call a contingency insurance program where you can get $25,000 from them for around about seven or $800. And it's based on when the, and you can get a million dollars for $16,000 out of them. So what happens is that, you know, who wants to be a millionaire was never given away by the TV network. That was all given away by Lloyd's of London. And the TV network simply paid an insurance premium. So in this instance, in some cases, we will say to a restaurant or hotel, um, why don't you offer a $50,000 prize because that'll cost you about a thousand 
dollars in insurance premium. And it, when the draw happens, that particular person is drawn. They're given the opportunity to choose one of 250 envelopes on a boardroom table, and one of those envelopes will have the fifty thousand dollars in it, and the other 250 envelopes, sorry, the other 249 envelopes will have you know dinner for six or dinner for twenty or whatever it might be. So therefore, you get the benefit of having a wow factor prize, but you're only paying a very small insurance premium to do that. Yeah, so really simple, direct response type advertising marketing concepts. It seemed like it's kind of gone the way of the bison with the digital arena, and yet digital, the tools that we have and the channels we have are set up perfectly for this sort of thing, to be able to reach out. And I guess where it disrupts it from the business brand storytelling side is all of a sudden, all of a sudden, newspaper, radio, expensive mass market brand awareness type advertising doesn't play a front role, doesn't have a front seat in this anymore. It's more about how you can do it right there with the people and then connect with them, you know, on their digital, on their iPhones, on their website, um, but then to give them something that they really care about so you're able to collect that data. Yep. That right. And, and look, it, it, uh, this particular restaurant didn't go down the path of using the insured prize, believe it or not. It was simply that they gave away a dinner for six at the end of each month. And what we found is that 88% of all customers who were asked to fill in the form, um, and keep in mind the waitress, waitresses were getting 50 cents for every form, so they stood over their shoulders <laughs> making them fill the form in. But 88% of all diners filled the form in. So nobody minds filling the form in if there's going to be the potential of a big benefit at the end but this benefit was simply a dinner for six at the uh, drawn at the end of each month yeah which i would think would really appeal to that target audience well Hmm. really great information here on today's show with the institute of wow and jd dwyer where can people learn more about you and your techniques and how they can start deploying them for their own brand storytelling well, thank you very much. Yeah, look, we have a um, we have two websites that I could send people to if they're interested in to to just swipe a whole bunch of these ideas. And if they wanted to talk to me, then that's fine too. But even if they just want to swipe a whole bunch of case studies that we have on these two websites, uh, the first one is theinstituteofwow.com. So that's theinstituteofwow.com. And the other one, which is a library of like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these sorts of ideas is uh, a a thing that we've set up online called Wow Central. And that one is wowcentral.com.au. And of course, the AU at the end of that one is for Australia. So that's uh, wowcentral.com.au. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, JD, for coming on and bringing a little bit of wow factor to business's story. I've taken some notes here, and I'm going to try some of this for my own work. It's really great to have you here. (laughs) My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me, Pat. All right. Thank you all for listening to this edition of Business of Story. If you like what you're hearing, please visit us on iTunes and give us a rating. Look, I'm doing a pledge drive, sort of. Um, I'm at 63 ratings on iTunes, which I think is just marvelous. And I appreciate all of you that have done that. I'm trying to eclipse that 100 mark by the end of the year. So if you haven't been there, if you wouldn't mind going on, rate the show, leave a comment. It helps us share our show with your world and it makes a big difference in what we're doing and so that we can bring story artists like JD to the rest of the world and we can all learn how to craft and tell compelling brand stories that sell and of course if you are looking for tools to help you in your journey in brand storytelling please visit me over at businessofstory.com and if you have an idea for someone on the show or um, a subject on the show please shoot me a note at park at businessofstory.com thank you again for listening and join us next Monday when we will have another incredible story artist for you to learn from. And until then, have a wonderful life.